driving gloves were a combination of gearheads. John, the instigator. Derek, the conservator. Will, the builder. Sean, the racer. And maybe a guest. Invite you to listen while they sit down, have a drink, and discuss cars. More to subscribe to the podcast with no driving gloves. Time now for the ride. As the intro said, if I remember to add it, I've been pretty good about that lately. I've been a little lax on getting out shows, but I've been remembering the intro at least. So when you get get a show, it's with intro. But no driving gloves. We're a little bit low on the population tonight. Um, I guess it's busy. Everybody's at their pre-inauguration parties. We're recording this on the night. Hey, hey, guys, keep it down back um, there. Keep it down. Oh, sorry, John. <laughs> yeah, so that means we're you're stuck with the. Uh, the two academics in the, the room. The best of the bunch. The best of the bunch. It's, uh, me, me and Derek, or Derek and I, I, I better check my Grammarly to make sure I said that correctly if I'm calling myself an academic and then I can't speak English. I believe it would be Derek and me because you would be, if it was just you, you would say me, not I. Well, maybe I would if I talk about myself in the third person. Well. Uh, you are joined by Derek and John and Derek. Derek and John. So what have you been up to, Derek? Anything exciting? Anything? You got your, uh, you built some damn building, I know. Uh, yeah. Yep. And then I just, you know, work more than 40 hours a week, somewhere around 60 at work, trying to get stuff done. And then the two foster kiddos take up the rest of the time. So there's a really pretty building in my backyard. It has two of my cars in it. and um, I might unlock the door one of these days and go in there. I I don't know. That's what I've always found when I've had my outbuildings. I just it's amazing the amount of effort it takes to walk out to the shop. That's one reason I kind of like this podcasting business because this studio is literally I open the door and I'm in my bedroom. It's kind of easy to stay in touch with the with family and you can hear the arguments and the fights among the kids and things like that. So, well, let's, let's put it this way. My, my birthday is in, Oh, I don't know. Let me do the math here. 12 days and it's on a Sunday. And my plan is that, uh, that entire weekend I will be in the building getting the insulation done, um, uh, running electricity, all that good stuff. And, uh, that's going to be my birthday gift is finish doing what I want to do in the barn. And then it'll sit for another few months before I go out there again. You know, that kind of stuff. Well, that's uh, honestly, I have the same conversation just about every Sunday night with my dad because he, he built a building about a year ago in his backyard. And he's slowly running, you know, running wires and getting some electricity done and working on the ins- just like you working on the insulation mm-hmm. and you know, I think it's weird. You, you build these buildings, and I even see it on some of the YouTube guys I follow. You build the building so that you can do your hobby in the building, and then all of a sudden the building becomes the big time suck. <laughs> you spend all your time working on the dang building as opposed to actually doing your hobby that you built the building for. You had more time for the hobby before you built the building. But the building's got to be just right if you're going to do your hobby in it. You can't be doing your hobby in a building that's not right. Come on, man. I'm very guilty of that. And I think anybody out there who's working on cars, working on doing woodworking, doing, uh, I'd even say knitting or whatever hobby you're in, I think a lot of people, and I'm definitely guilty of it, I spend a lot more time cleaning and reorganizing and making the, the area more efficient than I actually do a project. And right now, if I was to go out to my wood shop and try to do anything, it's going to take a day and a half to clean it before I could even like get to my table saw or get to my CNC. To have thought about cutting down the size of the wood shop so I can bring a car in because now that I'm not working on cars every day of my life, this stuff's becoming uh, a little bit more fun and might want to actually start tinkering on something. So mm. Get another Lotus. Oh, yeah. Well, it needs to be small. Yeah. <laughs> micro cars. Micro cars are small. Mm-hmm. And say, unfortunately, micro cars are expensive. And ah, 
I'm getting some communication to J. Lewis Productions for producing podcasts and editing podcasts. Not quite enough to afford that third car quite yet. So, yeah, I'm like you. I'm doing a lot of hours at some part-time jobs to have some steady income and devoting the rest of the time. It's probably 60 hours part-time income and 60 hours trying to build the business and squeeze in some family life in there. Um, I guess that's what I'm using the twins' time for because, fortunately... uh, the kids in the house aren't mine, and they're older, so they take a lot less attention to than the ones you have running around. Mm, yeah, yeah. Let's not mm, let's not talk about how much energy that's taken up. <sighs> <laughs> I'm actually I'm actually asleep most of the time that I'm actually like working or functioning on this podcast. You don't know it, but I'm actually sleeping in the background. Oh, you've taken on my habit of talking with your eyes closed. No. So talking with my eyes open while sleeping. Oh, so we've been chatting for a little bit here. Let's get into the car topic if we haven't lost oh. all of our listeners yet because we haven't really talked cars. Anything um, exciting, newsworthy? I know you threw out a topic right before the show that to at least touch on and discuss. You know, it's kind of a, a hot topic. Oh, so. oh, oh, wow. Too soon there. Bit of a burn, if you will. Ow. Uh, no, I, we should, I don't know. We could, we could, we could go down in flames. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The two, the two <laughs> museum guys on the show probably should not uh, be making flight or fun of this, but, um, obviously we're recording what I guess it's two days after maybe one day after, um, the it's, motorcycle museum. I think the, the news was yesterday. Cause I've got it here on a screen okay. for, for, um, yeah, the the uh, large motor 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 motorcycle museum in the Alps, and forgive me, I don't remember the exact name of it, John. I know you've got it in front of you there, but of course, it was a total loss to fire um, just the other night. You know, for any of us in the museum field, it's always kind of a, a heartbreak when you see something like that—a disaster occur at a museum like that. Of course, we've all seen flooded. You know, flooded museums. We've seen some museums that have had small fires. Uh, I myself was at Henry Ford Museum when one of the um, buildings in Greenfield Village caught fire and, of course, had to be on the disaster response team for that. Uh, effort uh, to recover artifacts from the building, but it's it's never pleasant to see something like this happen. And I think one of the things that you know struck me, John, and I think you saw it too. Of course, I'm not sure what term I want to use here for the the people, but uh, a lot of times you get what we'll call keyboard warriors, or you know, um, I'm trying to think of that's that's the name I usually call them. Uh, but the people that like to comment on social media about what happened and, you know, in, in this case, there was a lot of attacks on, oh, if you look at the pictures and the videos that were out, there was no fire suppression system and this, you know, that and the other thing about how it was built. And we don't know the answers to those questions. You know, I don't know how the building was constructed, what their disaster planning was. You don't always know what the fire suppression system is in the museum world because, yes, uh, many museums do have wet pipe systems, you know, a fire suppression, a wet, what we call wet pipe or a dry pipe system where the water floods in after the alarms go off. Uh, there's a lot of detail in that, but there's also systems that evacuate the air. Uh, there's dry chemical systems that are you know, not as noticeable in pictures and things like that, especially in archives and some high-end collections. So I think one of the things that uh, that irked me about it, John, and uh, you know, it's, it's sad to see some of the the loss of the artifacts that were in that collection. Um, there were some very rare bikes that are probably now absolutely nothing. But you know, the people that jump to conclusions on what went wrong to that museum, and yeah, you know, we we feel sorry for them and hope they can make something happen out of the the ashes. Uh, let's not be too quick to judge or be critical. Well, if we remember, um, the the museum we're talking about is the Top Mountain Motorcycle Museum, which to me is a very English name uh, for a museum that's uh, actually in um, Austria. I'm not even going to try to try to pronounce the name of the town. I was going to say, I think, I think that's the English trans translation of the actual name. And I think it just turns out that way. Because I saw a name that I could not pronounce. It's on a sign in front of the building. 
Oh, <laughs> man, like that. Man, so, maybe I'm wrong. There's another word on here. Timol uh, Jacques. I, 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 unfortunately, I don't speak German. But I mean, it, it was a, a nice place. And I don't know if how many of us really pay attention. And for some reason, it's odd. It's motorcycle museums. But in 03, uh, the National Motorcycle Museum burned down in England. And it was one of the largest collections of motorcycles also in the world. And it, it, it wasn't a total loss, but it suffered great damage. And they, they lost a bit significant portion of their collection, but they've been able to slowly recover. And you never know until, I guess, after the fire and you start assessing the damage on what is actually lost. I mean, the, the pictures of this, the entire structure is on fire. And it, I mean, I think it literally burned to the ground. And if the interior pictures of the place, it's gorgeous, but it's like being in a log cabin. I mean, it, it was the highest motorcycle museum in the world, which is an interesting claim. I guess you could also say it was the largest motorcycle museum at the highest altitude in the world. However, but it was very log cabin-ish, a lot of w exposed wood inside. And, you know, just that, I'll be honest, it reminds me of the inside of my mom's home. And she she lives in a log cabin in kind of the middle of nowhere. And my ex-wife used to complain that anytime we'd go over there, you'd fall asleep. And actually, I think every companion I've had that has spent significant time there, you kind of go in and it's warm. And, you know, we're always there in December because, well, <laughs> it's about the only time I make it back except for last year. And you just, it just, it's this warm, cozy environment. It's nice to see. It's a gorgeous place. It's a tragic loss. What I'm trying to remember, oh, it was uh, how I remember the whole story. And we talk about, and there could be some validity to this case when you're talking the dry chemicals or you're talking air evacuation systems, as opposed to sprinklers, because we all, I think as car people, and we'll bring, I'm going to bring this into the car realm, uh, the Tim Special is this big, long, flowing um, car from the 30s. It was totally, it was a kind of a lost car. And a buddy of mine in Wills actually was involved heavily in the restoration of this car and basically had to fabricate the body from scratch. And they built it and they showed it. And you know, I saw it and Alana on display and just absolutely gorgeous car. But when we had the big fires in California about a year and a half ago or whatever, the car was lost. The gentleman that owned it lost his entire car collection. His garage caught fire and it burned to the ground because his home and his storage facility was in an area that was evacuated and the, you know, the fire department just let it burn down. Did not try to put out the fires, didn't even really have access to the building to get there. And they attribute that fact that they did not try to put the fire out as the reason the Tim Special is actually being restored again, because it didn't cause a rapid cooling. When the water makes contact with the metal, it causes a rapid cooling and changes the structure and makes the metal brittle and and such, where in the tin, this case, the aluminum body just melted onto the chassis. And, you know, they lost er everything, but there's enough of the car that the owner feels it can be restored. And I don't know if the insurance company necessarily <laughs> agrees with that, but it's undergoing a restoration again and touched on with the same buddy. He he provided some estimates for the restoration. Uh, they're electing to use a, a, a different shop just because of logistics in the situation, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a significant amount of money, but because no water was applied to the car, it's able to be restored. Uh, there was a Lotus 49 or something that I believe, I think it was a 49 that, that crashed and <clears throat> caught <clears throat> caught fire in a race. It was never extinguished. They just let the car burn to the ground. They got the chassis back and it changed the metallurgy of the chassis and it became one of the most successful whatever model of Lotus that was just because of whatever the, the heat treatment to the frame did. So there can be some advantages. And, you know, if this museum is... The internet experts have speculated, and we all know everybody on Facebook and Twitter knows more than the fire inspectors that are on site. Maybe there wasn't sprinklers, and maybe that's going to allow them to potentially save and yeah, restore some of these bikes. I mean, 
I think everybody knows my history with the Barber Museum, and it's amazing what can be done and what can be found in the motorcycle world to put something back together. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, it is, uh, and not to drive too deep into to some topic that we don't need to cover on no driving gloves, but it's it's something that probably a lot of people don't understand when we are uh, looking at museum safety, things like that within collections. And I know a lot of private collectors that, you know, if they've got a big collection, you know, fire suppression is something they're looking at, which, which route to go, because there are so many different uh, thought processes, um, you know, and it, it all goes into what type of structure you have. I mean, there's so much you have to look at when building a, uh, you know, a, a facility for either a museum, a private collection, whatever you're doing that, uh, how you're going to basically deal with a fire breaking out. You know, if you have a fire suppression, you know, a wet system where you're dumping water on it, is it because you're trying to put it out before anything else catches on fire? So in other words, before the cars are on fire and and it might do damage because the metal is so hot, um, are you trying to evacuate all oxygen so it just snuffs the fire out? And the chemicals aren't going to do any damage uh, to the vehicles that, you know, the fire hasn't already done. Or, as John said, do you elect to let the building burn around everything and, you know, hope that it's not going to change metallurgy within the collection, uh, you know, things like that. So it's I think it's a deeper subject than most people realize most museums or collections get into um, when they're thinking about it. Well, I'm sure you've had conversations with uh, your board or your, you know, executive committee at the museums you've been affiliated with, and especially after, you know, your incident at the Henry Ford. I'm sure there's conversation and discussion on what happens. You know, fortunately, Barber's never, never has had that instance, but we've also had sprinkler failures because the building was built 17 years ago. Uh, sometimes some of the some of the pipes have corroded and they've dripped water on some of the, you know, artifacts. And then you got to shut down and drain that portion of the system because the systems stay full of water at all times because if, they need to be. You, if you have a wet pipe system, you can have a dry pipe system, which actually dry pipe systems tend to corrode faster than uh, wet pipe systems. And then you get into the. Um, you know, even the way sprinkler systems work, because everybody knows how sprinkler systems work. And it's just like on TV that you hold the big lighter up to one sprinkler and you flood the entire building. That's the way they work, right, Derek? Sure, John. That's exactly how they work. <laughs> yeah, when you're watching those spy movies and they got to get out of the building, so they just trip all the sprinklers. That's exactly how the system works. Yeah, actually, a sprinkler head, in a, in a, as for those that don't know, and I know this, we're, we're way off cars. The way a sprinkler head works is it's usually a wax plug or something, and it heats up to a point where it melts, or there's a, a metal in there, and then it heats up to a point and expands and opens up the sprinkler, and that single sprinkler goes off. And then if the fire spreads, the next sprinkler goes on, and the next sprinkler goes on. So if the left, you know, if the west wing catches on fire, the the east wing of the museum doesn't get you mm -hmm. know flooded it's just it's isolated to a small area and if everything functions correctly only one or two sprinkler heads should activate and put out the fire uh in, in, in a water system and most of them are the exact same way it's a limited damage but you know i guess i'm going to say our, you know our hearts and feelings go out it doesn't matter if it's a motorcycle collection or a car collection or a watch collection or, you know, any any time a museum catches fire, whether it be to a warehouse or the actual museum or, you know, losing artifacts, I guess, no denying, while they may be able to save some things, there's no doubt certain pieces of history have been lost forever. And it happens with you know, what happens with everything and you never know what happens. I mean, obviously the museum you're affiliated with had, you know, a tragic thing that you really couldn't plan for. I'm sure now when you build museums in Kentucky, they plan for, they might I, look I at believe, that. 
Yeah, I believe sinkholes have been added to disaster planning on a number of museums in the Kentucky, <laughs> Tennessee, um, you know, this kind of the cave region, the karst region of America, although they happen in a lot of other places too. I mean, Florida has it. But yeah, it's definitely one of those things where when we're doing our disaster planning, uh, you it seems like you can never plan for everything. Tornadoes, fire, flood, you know, the normal natural disasters, you kind of got covered. But I don't think you can plan for everything because something's going to something's going to come up that you never expected. I guess to get off this whole natural disaster thing. Oh, you're, you're missing my great joke. It's, you know, oh, just right. to, you know, pull the floor out from under you. <laughs> <laughs> so, as okay, I was saying, <laughs> to get off the whole natural disaster thing, uh, I, yeah, one of the things you, you mentioned in there, John, and my mind just sprung to it was, you know, you mentioned that when we have a natural disaster, fire or something like that, you know, we lose pieces to history. And it just got me thinking about, like, what, being that this is an automotive podcast, what cars have been lost to history due to some type of fire. I mean, we know some of them have been lost due to the World War II scrap drive, um, things like that. But as, as you said, the just lost the name of it. It was the Tim special. Yeah. Uh, right. You know, that was lost over time, has been re-lost to a fire. It's going to be rebuilt. Yeah. You know, but I, th- I think back to, and I don't know that we'll ever know exactly which cars were lost, but there was a big collector in Detroit. If if some of our listen listeners don't know about this gentleman, Barney Pollard is is actually probably one of the key people, along with Bill Hara, credited with saving uh, really a lot of the early American automobiles that still exist to this day. Barney Pollard was up in Detroit, and he literally bought an old ware- factory warehouse property in the city, went around the country buying up antique cars. And yeah, I mean, this is in the, the late 20s, 30s, I think into the 40s. He even, you know, he kind of kept them hidden from the scrap drive, stuff like that. You know, there was a massive fire in one of the buildings he had. And I mean, just a ton of cars were lost. And I don't think there was any inventory on those cars, but it just, you know, it kind of got me thinking like, what, which cars have we lost to history just either due to a natural disaster or just that they're just gone? Because there are some great cars that are just gone. Well, I I go into the, you know, we're going to jump back to motorcycles, the original Daimler motorcycle. Oh, yeah. yeah, Caught on fire. So there are, there, there is no original. Everything, everyone you see is a reproduction. Actually, I have the uh, hot tube ignition burner sister system for one of those reproductions in the barn right now, trying to get it to burn correctly. We just won't go. Don't there. worry, don't worry. There's like three fire extinguishers <laughs> and a five gallon bucket of water. And, and if you go into, you know, a touch of irony or whatever, wherever it is, we don't know. And everybody kind of assumes it's gone forever. But you go into eat, you know, go to the movie Easy Rider and the Captain America bike. The one there were two of them. One got stolen and during production and disappeared. Nobody knows where it is. You know, supposedly um, the guy that played Grizzly Adams for those that go back to the 70s may or may not have had it or somehow been knew where it was. Uh, but the the other bike, when it crashed and burned up in the movie, it crashed and burned up in the movie. And so it was it was lost. And everyone you see now is, you know, a reproduction or a replica and one of the, I think one of the most noteworthy fires in automotive history, at least to sports car people, is, you know, they had a fire at the Jaguar factory in, was it 57 or 58? And it took out a huge production of XK120s and the XKSS. That's why there's only, what, 14 or 16 XKSSs, you know, the really low number, because the rest of the mm-hmm. production went up with the building. And then, they, you know, they were lost and they didn't go back and build them again. They were a limited run car to begin with. Fire is tragic and it, it happens and takes out a lot of collections. Um, takes out, I want to say, even individual vehicles. We all dr- have driven by a car fire on the side of the road or such. The last one I drove by, I don't understand. You can see where the person drove. 
And you know where they decided to stop to wait for the fire truck? Not the Walgreens, not the Aldi's. It's right there. No, they decided to pull into the gas station and pull up. And well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the gas station has a fire suppression system that, you know, they could set off. If they park at the Walgreens or the CVS, there's just cars just going to burn. <laughs> I mean, I, I at least appreciate the people that, you know, when they understand that their car is on fire, and it's probably a car that should be catching on fire. I mean, I, I like driving by the ones where people have their marshmallows out and they're just roasting them away <laughs> like, hey, hey, getting rid of this car. <sighs> just don't take a picture for the insurance company. I was taught way early in my driving career, uh, you know, some of this, the things. You have an accident, you always call the police and get a police report. You know, basic things like that. One of the things I was taught is if your car catches on fire, you shoot the first guy who goes for the phone. You just let the damn thing burn to the ground because you're <laughs> never going to get it right. <laughs> it's always going to exactly. smell like smoke at some point. There's always going to be an electrical issue or something. Just let the thing burn to the ground. And mm -hmm. I'll be honest, though, it's hard. I, I had a friend in high school. His truck caught on fire. A fuel line came off or something. And he, he ended up with second degree burns on his hands because he opened the hood and tried to put out the fire with snow. He kept picking up snow off the side of the road and he did extinguish the fire. But you know what? Uh, as long as I knew him, that truck had a slight smoke smell to it and never went, never went away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it, I guess it depends. I mean, there was, you know, I mean, antique cars will catch on fire on tour sometime, uh, stuff like that. And I mean, the guys get them out pretty quick. Most of us, well, any of us that know that we're taking our cars out for a drive have uh, fire extinguishers inside of them because you never know when something's going to go wrong with an antique car. You got to remember you've got pretty simple carburetors that just giant bowl of fuel just sitting there. And a lot of times engineers in the early days weren't mm, the most intelligent at some things and there are a number of cars that the carburetor sits either directly below beside or above the exhaust pipe so they can catch on fire pretty quickly if something goes wrong you flood the carburetor out on a good hot engine and um, next thing you know you're putting a fire out and hoping you can get to the gas shut off valve and all of those kind of things to stop the car from burning yeah, yeah. I guess we should though put a disclaimer here. We've kind of joked a lot about fire, but it, I mean it's it's a serious thing. It's a, a race car driver's worst nightmare. Even even to this day, I think drivers are more scared of a fire than anything else. Um, you know, it's used to be that's why they didn't want seatbelts is because every time they crash, the car would catch fire because literally like single seat race cars in the definitely 60s, again, we talked a lot about a Barber Museum. We had John Surtees' 1964 Ferrari. You know, he won the world championship in that. But it literally, you sit in the thing, and on the above your legs is a fuel tank, and beside you on each side is a fuel tank, and there's a motor behind you. And all you are is the computer that makes the thing go right and left. It, it's a bomb. And... Mm -hmm. It crashes, it's going to catch fire, and that's why you didn't wear seatbelts is you could maybe have a chance of escaping before you burn to death because a seatbelt would slow you in getting out of the car. And, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it comes into just a couple of months ago when uh, Roman Grosjean, whatever the correct pronunciation of his name, who I can't mm -hmm. remember who he raced with this year, you know, he crashed into a barrier in a very odd way. And very rarely do you see fires in, in Formula One racing anymore. Uh, like that. And, you know, it caused it. The fire ended up, you know, burning him significantly on the hands. And I know he's chosen to retire from the sport from it because, you know, I don't know, because of the injuries or if it's one of those things that eh, maybe I've done this enough and I've, you know, OK, I've lived eight of my nine lives. You know, it's still relevant today. And it took him a few moments to get out of the car. And that, you know, I think most of his burns happened when he jumped over the guardrail and the guardrail, had, you know, was basically like touching a hot stove, but, um, it still took him a little bit of time to get out of there and, you know, caused some in injuries where, you know, of course mm -hmm. if there weren't seatbelts, he'd be dead, but <laughs> that's a whole nother word. So, I mean, it is fire serious. And, you know, I 
joke about shooting the first guy to go for the phone or first guy who calls the fire department. No, um, that's why every collector car I've ever had, it re- I really should do it with even my modern automobile, should have a fire, extinct- fire extinguisher in it. You know, my 7 had one in it. My Elan had one in it. My Europa had one in it. Of course, the Europa had one in it. They, You know, everything I've ever had that's uh, classic or off-roadish, you know, as much as I despise Jeeps, we, well, here, here she is again. My ex-wife and I had a Wrangler and we had a, you know, every now and then we go off-roading in it and it had a fire extinguisher in it because you never know what's, what can happen. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't know if, you know, and, and in that case, it's not necessarily to put the vehicle out, but it's maybe to put the tree out that catches fire so you don't burn down the whole state like they do in california is there anything more positive or happening the in the world you know there's this little guy who owns a little car company who's now you know taken on amazon and is the richest man in the world guess he's having a good day we talking about your buddy yeah my buddy no I'd like to get him on the podcast at some point i guess i didn't follow up with the elon news sorry uh, yeah. I had not heard that yet, and it didn't get the smart news update on my phone. I hate phones, by the way. Yeah, that happened uh, about a week ago, week and a half ago. He surpassed good old Jeffy there. I think it was like 186 to $183 billion. Like, well, and- I mean, the other thing, I mean, obviously, the other thing that's happening big, I mean, 2020 was kind of an epic failure of a year for everybody. Uh, but 2021 is coming out of the gate, at least for the automotive world, somewhat strong, uh, it, depending on what way you lean, I guess, with the automotive market. But a lot of EV news coming out of both Ford and General Motors. Of course, General Motors changing their logo um, to a more EV appearing, you know, electric vehicle, modern looking logo. What do you think uh, of that? Do you like that new logo? Or are you indifferent? Uh, I, or, or I guess that maybe you're not the person to ask. But, <laughs> but I guess be- I'm I'm kind of I, I'm kind of indifferent. I I guess like everybody has to. I think, you know, I, I work in museums. I work, you know, and I mean, just look around. I mean, if you let your branding get stale, if you let your marketing get stale, your company is often forgotten. Um, you know, if you, if you have a, a, for lack of a better term, a stodgy old feel to your logo, it gives that same feel to your company. Every automotive company has revamped their logo over time. Uh, you know, it changes changes necessary in this world, or else, as I say, you get left behind. And yeah, you know, we see it in in almost everything. You know, somebody announces a change, and you know, there's the I guess what I'll call the old guard that's like, "Whoa, it's not the way it used to be." Well, yeah, because. There are new generations behind us that view things differently in this world. There's, uh, you know, change on the horizon. I mean, if if we always stayed the same, uh, we wouldn't have indoor plumbing right now. I, you know, we wouldn't have automobiles. Things change. I I don't know what to say. I mean, it's if a company can stay relevant with you know changing their logo and rebranding and having new ideas, then I'm all for it. And I know everybody out there respects my opinion on style as as part of the half of the podcast that really enjoys the new BMW grill. You know, um, but I I kind of like the new uh, General Motors logo. Um, I don't see the gas pump in it that everybody talks about. It's a neat, interesting, modern design. It's I don't I don't think it's timeless. It's going to have to change again. You know, that's a 10-year logo, and it's going to have to be revamped again. You know, the previous General Motors logo is is kind of timeless, and that's probably because it's been there through all time. I don't mind the new... Which it has. The, the new look, and you consider the amount... It accomplished something. It kept GM in the news for a while, got people talking, uh, really highlighted, you know, the people that are complaining are petrol powered people, you know, people that like gasoline cars and are anti EV and, you know, the, the the new Hummer should go away and should have never been created. I think to the EV people and the people that General Motors is targeting, 
And, you know, I, I don't care what side of the fence you're on and what you think. Unfortunately, because of EU laws and restrictions, uh, if you're going to be a player in the global market, you're going to have to look at this EV technology. And I think I think the move by General Motors and the uh, the logo is very, you know, very relevant. I think it's a good move. Um it's you know it's it's playing but look at look at all the other companies that change their logo or change up their style zara and i were just talking the other night about the um what are they called um uh talk dog, ta- taco taco chi- or tacos k- 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 kentucky chicken or kentucky taco huts and that you know those those have only been around 30 years and the de- decor of that's changed Three or four times in the last thirty years, um, I used to be friends with uh, somebody who ended up being on some of the the logo and the advertising companies for uh, whatever company owns. You know, they owns Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, and Kentucky Fried Chicken. But you know, those logos change. The you know local gas station logo changes. Uh, hell. The, the names change. I mean, when I grew up, we had Standard, which became Amico, which is now BP. And, the, you know, the logos change. So it's going to happen. Not everybody's going to like it. But I really well, think. Well, but think about how many times each each car company or, or, you know, Mark within General Motors Corporation, his logos have changed. The Chevy bow tie has changed numerous times. The Buick logo has changed numerous times, always using the same elements, but changed numerous times. The, I mean, Oldsmobile's logo changed over time. All of them changed over time, whether it was tweaked a little, tweaked a lot, and nobody seemed to complain when it was the badge on the car changing a bit. So what does it matter if the overall company's logo changes a little? It's Still got GM in it, doing better than um, what do we call it now? What it, 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 I don't even know. Stellantis now. I mean, at least it at least GM still has all their name. Uh, you know, unlike some other companies. So, like I said, I, I think I too think too soon. Too soon. Sorry. Say from an advertising standpoint, the logo did what it's supposed to. It made news. It got people talking, and it's going to be there. And I think the pro EV people are, are going to love it or do love it because it's something for them. You know, mm-hmm. Corvette buyers are going to buy Corvettes. Camaro buyers are going to buy Camaros and such. But for the Volt buyers or the Bolt buyer buyers or the new Hummer, you know, to me, the new Hummer is an outstanding vehicle. And if I had a hundred grand for an electric vehicle, if I had a hundred grand for a vehicle, that new Hummer would be go. on my list. Uh, it's just, to me, the technology in it is just so impressive. And it's really highlighting what can be done when a multi-billion dollar company decides to go for it. I mean, mm-hmm. Porsche proved yeah. it with the Taycan, other than they don't know how to name a damn car. Taycan or whatever it is, their electric thing. And Mercedes has been a little quiet about it. As these major manufacturers start getting into the game, the richest man in the world is going to have some concerns. But um, going back to him, a lot of the new Tesla development isn't in the car realm. It's in battery plants and battery technology. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he's going to have built I think he's going to have built a car for 15 or 20 years and created this revolution and this movement and proved the validity of the car. But he's going to become more of a supplier to the major manufacturers. You know, I don't think Elon's an idiot. You know, he's going to do that, and he, you know, he might deliver your batteries via rocket. But you know, he's. It's just always an interesting thing. And hey, if that's how you're going to make your company work, I mean, Bezos uses um, uh, drones. <laughs> Elon uses rockets. What you know? Hey, come on. You know, although he can't use rockets because that's fuel. You know, that's 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 fuel powered. He's got to go electric on those electric rockets. I don't know how that's going to work. I don't know. But, I, you know, I want to touch on that. I know we only got a couple minutes left here, John, but I really like I'm trying to think of where to start because you said something a little bit ago, but I was kind of letting you finish your train of thought. 
you know, we talk about change in this logo and people getting worked up and we're moving into the EV, you know, and there's, there's guys out there that are, you know, just die hard, uh, you know, petrol guys. Yeah, I want my gas powered engine and I get it. I mean, I've got a car collection of early gas powered stuff and man, early engines are cool and engines are cool, but we've, we've, we've got to make a, a chain like, and I'm, I'm not saying environmental friendly, this, that, the other thing, but it's just the direction everything's going is these electric vehicles. There's, you know, benefits to them. There's drawbacks to them. I'm not going to get on one side or the other of this. Again, going back to, you know, things have to change over time. That's just how the world progresses. I mean, what if the people that thought horses were the way to go had won and no automobile company ever built a car? We'd be riding horses to this day. Things are going to change. Things are going to move on. And, you know, there's still people that ride horses. There's still people that have them. There's, they're still around. It's not like they went away forever. You know, I, I don't think that we're going to see that gas powered cars are going to go away anytime soon necessarily. You know, the collectors are still going to have them. Some people are still going to be driving them, but we're going to move into an electric vehicle world that is, you know, the cars on the road are going to be more populated with electric motors than they are gas engines. And that's, that's where we're headed. And I, I think it's kind of cool. It's technological progression. Let's see where technology takes us. I mean, we're supposed to have flying cars and be living in houses that are on giant poles sticking off the earth, and our cars are supposed to go everywhere we go right now. Uh, that didn't happen. Well, the Porsche does that. That's true. Well, it just makes the noise. And, yeah, you know, we, we've talked electric cars a lot, and I, electric might not be the way we end up going, but it's, it's this phase in the development. And I think when you start single phase or two phase or um, three phase, well, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I can't tell you D DC or AC. Uh, it's a way of going. And I'll be honest. You look at the performance numbers. There's going to be a lot of guys with gas powered cars at the drag strip going, what the heck? I mean, <laughs> you know, you know, it's, it's electric motors that are getting these cars into the, zero to 60 times of, you know, sub two seconds. And as they keep getting added and keep getting built, yeah, I'm sure a gas motor would have eventually, eventually got us there too. But excuse me, the electric stuff goes on, the electric stuff goes on and does it, does it efficiently and does it quick. And, um, and then when you don't want to go zero to 60 in two seconds and you want to take the wife to dinner or take the husband to dinner or take the kids to soccer, the car is very manageable. And, you know, it's you don't have a big, you know, looping cam and a funky idle and poor gas mileage. The car, the car is much more adaptable. And I think that's that's an appeal to electric cars people don't realize. You can have this balls-to-the-wall performance car, and then you can turn around and have this Peaceful, quiet, smooth riding, you know, four-door sedan that kind of does everything. Now you throw the new Hummer in, it can do both of those. Plus, it'll go probably anywhere you ever wanted to go on top of where a Land Rover can go or a Jeep can go other than trail width because it's still a damn big truck. Mm -hmm. So just one final thought here, because I don't know any, I don't have any good, good friends that own Teslas that I've, I've ridden in a Tesla a long time ago. Um, I'm just curious when did, did Elon have to pay royalties to Ludacris? And when you put it in Ludacris mode, uh, as you're driving, does it just go Luda? Well, I don't think it's a ludicrous licensing thing, but if you look at the way he names his cars, he might have to f chip a couple of bucks to Mel Brooks. Because that is you, true. You do have ludicrous, and now you have the Tesla Model S Plaid, and we all know what plaids. And I think with that note, we probably should just go ahead and leave everybody to go. Uh, uh, I think we oh, just need to end. Yeah, watch Spaceballs. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
Been good talking to you, Derek. Find No Driving Gloves at nodrivinggloves.com. There's links to everywhere that you can subscribe to us, find us. Shows are there, information's there, links are there, buy us a coffee there. Guest list, we've got a couple of really cool guests just around the corner. We've got, uh, rumor has it, we're going to have a drag racer on here in a couple of, and possibly next week. I'm in heavy talks with a guy that painted all of Evil Knievel's motorcycles and helmets and has some pretty cool evil stories. Him and I have been friends for a few years, and he's starting to do some custom artwork. So he he's on the list to be interviewed. A uh, couple of big-time players in the podcast world. You know, we had Matt Farah last fall and D- David Pesciuto, who's not a car guy, but in that. So... Me, me watching, we've got some guests lined up. 2021 is looking pretty exciting for the No Driving Gloves front. Uh, we're going to get out there. I and just spent a bunch of money today on some new equipment, put some old equipment up for but, sale uh, so that we can be be more mobile. Yeah, I think we're going to have some uh, uh, significant designers from the automotive world on the show coming up as well. Um, I've been working on uh, some of that as well as... Uh, couple more um, large collectors that I've been talking to. So I think it'll be a good year, John. We're looking forward to it. We'll see who, what hosts join us next. I don't know. Do we need to come up with a fine? You know, we're not doing Zambonis anymore. Maybe it's time we come up with a tagline. If you've got a tagline, send it to oh, us. Email man. us at nodrivinggloves at gmail.com or send it to us on our Facebook page. And uh, maybe we'll come up with a tagline. We can't use Luda, can we? No. I uh, uh, I'm not a big one for taken. it, but I think you'd have Zara's heart. I think it's taken. <laughs> Plaid no speed. driving gloves out. I say, Plaid speed to y'all. <laughs> Thank you for listening, and remember to look us up at nodrivinggloves.com. There you can find back episodes, links to products we recommend, and links to all of our social media. Be sure to tell a friend about us. No Driving Gloves is edited and produced by J. Lewis Productions. <laughs>